So thank you, Claire, and also a very warm welcome from me to this, the most important alumni event in the university's calendar. Just by way of brief, brief background, Sir John Cockcroft was a student here and therefore uh, an alumni of the University of Manchester, and Lord Ernest Rutherford, of course, was a member of staff, and both were honoured with the Nobel Prize. So this lecture was set up annually uh, to commemorate them and to celebrate all of our alumni. I'm told that uh, there are probably nearly 400,000 graduates of the University of Manchester and its predecessor institutions around the world. Uh, we're certainly in touch with several hundred thousand and we would like to be in touch with more. So if you're aware of alumni, then please uh, do put them in touch with us. And we welcome you on campus both today and indeed on other days as well. So I think we have about 800 alumni who've been visiting us here. Uh, some of you I know have been on tours of the campus. Um, those of you who haven't had time to do that, please contact Claire through the alumni office. We're very happy uh, to welcome you and to show you around. Welcome also to many of the staff uh, who've joined us here today, particularly uh, those in the biomedical areas and health sciences areas. So I don't want to sp take too much of your time, but uh, just to make a few comments um, on recent events in the, at the University of Manchester. And there have been some exciting developments. Uh, yesterday, I had the privilege of being taken round the National Graphene Institute by one of our Nobel laureates, Kostya Novoselov, and it is a truly spectacular building. It feels more like a spaceship than a building. The Manchester Cancer Research Centre will have its formal opening next week opposite the Christie and it's only a few months ago since we opened the spectacular refurbishment and extension of the Whitworth Art Gallery and you'll have seen many other refurbishments going on. We're having a, a dry run of closing Oxford Road, you may have spotted, uh, for when it actually closes for real to cars next uh, year by which time people will have got used to it. We have identified a number of uh, research beacons in the university, which if you look on our website, you can see the five areas that we're promoting, particularly several of them very relevant uh, to the discussions that we're having today. We've been very pleased also to win a number of national and indeed some international awards for our communications and for our social responsibility agenda, which is extremely important to us. We're welcoming two new vice presidents and deans, both of whom started last Monday, but I think uh, feel part of the university already. Professor Ian Greer, who is vice president and dean of the Faculty of Medical and Human Sciences, and Professor Martin Schroeder, who's vice president and dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences. And a warm welcome to them as well. Some of you will have heard earlier uh, comments about how exciting it is to be working in anything related to health in Manchester at the moment because of what has now become known as Devo Mank, which is, of course, the devolution of the health budget to Greater Manchester. Great challenge, huge opportunity, fantastic excitement. Uh, and one of the things that uh, Sally and I were discussing was how it has brought together different groups with interest in health. The university is very much at the heart of those developments, and there is such excitement around the possibilities for Devo Manx. So I think it would be fair to say we'll be seeing some significant changes, some opportunities, and hopefully some improvements. I'm personally delighted uh, that we managed to attract Dame Sally Davis uh, to speak, uh, uh, be our speaker this evening. Uh, as many of you will know, Dame Sally is in fact a graduate in medicine. Uh, from the University of Manchester. And she was telling us a few fond memories of doing things uh, that she should have done and shouldn't have done uh, while she was here at the time. I'm, she may not be revealing those, but if you read the article, I think um, you will uh, uh, learn a little bit about it. So Sally graduated in 1972, and since then, she's made a number of outstanding contributions to science and health. She was Director General for Research at the Department of Health and was instrumental in transforming the funding for health research in England. Then in 2010, she was appointed Chief Medical Officer for England. And indeed, we also honoured her again a couple of years ago with an honorary doctorate at the university. She was made a Dame Commander of the British Empire. She is a Fellow of the Royal Society. She is a Fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. And indeed, um, she... Uh, also has a number of other national and international roles. Sally is known as somebody who um, could easily be a Mancunian. Uh, and in fact, I understand she's from Birmingham, but likes to say things how they are and is direct. And I'm sure she will be so in this lecture. And is going to tell us uh, that the drugs don't work, a global threat, which is something, if you don't know about, you will do 
and you need to know about. So a very warm welcome to Sally to present the annual Cockroft Rutherford Lecture. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back in Manchester. I've had uh, many happy days here, much teeth gnashing when it came to exams. I wasn't always as good as I should be. So I'm going to take you a bit on the story of why I've become a global advocate about antimicrobial resistance and then what it means, where we're going, what we're doing, so that I hope I can recruit all of you, too, to be champions in this. And it starts with me being appointed as Chief Medical Officer. It's a statutory post, started 165 years ago, and it will be no surprise to all of you <laughs> that I'm the first one. And one of the pleasures of this post is that I get to write an annual report every year. And I thought, all right, I come from a very science background. I like evidence. I like data. I would do it in two volumes. I would do a surveillance data, a data volume every year. And I'd do a second where I would get the real experts to come and help me put it all together about a subject that I would choose. And I would decide the subject, work with them, what were they going to do, and then make a plea to the world, the government, the public, about what that meant for policy. So I did just that. And I started with infection. And it was published as my first annual report in March 2013. I got all these experts in, and they agreed they'd write their chapters, and they came back to tell me what they'd written. And one after another, they talked about antimicrobial resistance. Now, antimicrobial resistance takes in resistance of any infective organism, whether it's a fungus, a virus, whatever, to um, the treatment. I slide between AMR, antimicrobial resistance, and antibiotic resistance because bugs, bacteria, are the big problem at the moment. So forgive me that I slide between. What I heard them say, one after another, was this had become a serious problem. And I remember sitting in this hot room in the bowels of the Department of Health, and I said, so this matters. You're the experts. What have you done? And one by one, they put up their hand and said, well, I told so-and-so. And I said, oh, shit, so you haven't got a voice. You've let this happen on your watch. But actually, we've all let it happen on our watch because, as I'm going to show you, we have disinvested in the underpinning science and we're all having to rediscover that. And it really does matter to us all. So a, an honorary professor here, Jim O'Neill, is doing a review for the, for the Prime Minister of the economics of antimicrobial resistance and the market failure. And his first paper showed this model, where what you can see is actually if you compare the deaths from cancer now, they're about 8.2 million a year globally, and if we don't do anything and we go on the trajectory we're on, there will be far more deaths from antimicrobial resistance. It doesn't stop there. It actually impacts the world economy such that by 2050, we would lose the equivalent of the UK economy to the global economy. We'd lose two to three and a half percent of the global economy for a variety of reasons. This is serious. And, you know, we have to be very careful because it will impact the developing world. Jim O'Neill's favorite bricks and mints, he was known for coining those words, more than it will the developed world but we are not immune. Interestingly, their modeling showed that if we could delay the development by three years, by just 10 years, actually, we could save $65 trillion of output between now and 2050. So anything we can do to delay the development of antimicrobial resistance in its broadest sense 
is important. And why is it a problem now? It's a problem now, as I'm going to show you, because we have not been making new antibiotics. No new ones on the market that weren't designed before the 1990. I trained in the golden era. I worked in the 90s in the golden era. Oh, Sally, your patient's got a resistant bug. That's OK. Let's just open the cupboard and get the next antibiotic out. They were there for us to use, and they worked very effectively. Think of what we're going to lose if we don't get more antibiotics and make the ones we've got last longer. Cancer drugs generally make people have a low immune system and they get infections. Without antibiotics, many of us would die. Organ transplants are based on them. Um, even joint replacements or caesarean sections. Better outcomes, safer, fewer deaths with antibiotics. So we are at risk of losing modern medicine. And that would be a tragedy to go backwards. It does make it quite an interesting one because um, I say sometimes to drug companies, well, it's time you made some antibiotics. And they said, no, no, we're sticking to cancer drugs. And then I say, ah, so when you produce a cancer drug in 10 years' time, and I say, and you say to me, well, you, you want this because you've got cancer, I might say I'd prefer to do my bucket list and die naturally than take your cancer drug and die of an untreatable infection. Bucket list versus early death of infection? Not difficult, is it? But it's already a reality. We know that in Europe, the same number die every year as on our roads, 25,000. Similar sort of number at a conservative estimate in the States, and this horrible statistic of one child under five dying every five minutes in Southeast Asia because of resistant bacteria. And some of you may have seen the headlines that in India they have 60,000 infants die every year because of um, antibiotic resistance infections. So let's just have a look at it. We had about 43% of deaths were due to infections before we had antibiotics. Along comes Fleming, notices some uh, clear areas in an agar plate where he's growing bugs and found penicillin. That and sulfonamides found a couple of years later absolutely transformed um, World War II. It transformed how we look after patients. It was the medical breakthrough that kick-started the new era. I think antibiotics versus the genome as the great medical discoveries last year, they're pretty neck and neck. But even he, when he picked up his Nobel Prize, highlighted that resistance was natural, resistance would happen, and we should protect against it. So we moved to that golden era I've mentioned, where at the moment only 7% of deaths are caused by infections. And according to the World Health Organization, antibiotics have given us, on average, an extra 20 years of life. So where did it go wrong? Well, we stopped discovering new antibiotics. It is a lack of investment. It's complex, it's difficult, and it's not sexy. People didn't want to go into it. Indeed, I could show you the slide of the Surgeon General in the States who said, we can now close the, the uh, book on infectious diseases in the late 60s. We've cured them. It's over. Of course, we got HIV. But do you know that 7% of HIV viruses are resistant to the first-line drug? This is a problem for all infections. So here we are, standing at the dawn of a post-antibiotic era, without a pipeline, as I'm going to show you later, of new ways, drugs coming through. 
and we don't really want to go back to where we were. We rely on antibiotics. If you look at this data, I know it's dense, but it makes a point. 35 million courses of antibiotics prescribed by GPs alone in England each year. I've mentioned prophylactic antibiotics. I've mentioned the low death rate at the moment of infections. But what I want you to look at is that last line. Across the world, more than 70%, nearly 80% of antibiotics are used in animals. I'm going to come back to that because this is important. So clearly, we need to look after the antibiotics we've got. But let me take one example, and it's gonorrhea. And gonorrhea has risen by 25% in the last year. It is only looked after by experts who follow the guidelines. So these aren't people who mess around. They know what they're doing, yet... That yellow line at the top, keftrioxone, the last and the best drug, we now have 2% of bugs resistant to it. And gonorrhea, untreated, is pretty unpleasant. Let's think about TB. Here you have multi-drug resistance, and it's been going up in Europe, across the world, dramatically. We now have extreme drug resistant TB, particularly in the former USSR, Eastern Europe, going into Russia, India and Pakistan. That's almost impossible to treat. This is a very difficult problem. And it's made more difficult because of its complexity. So I've been talking about humans. I've been suggesting to you that we don't have enough new antibiotics and that what we've got is often misused and that that contributes to developing resistance. Low levels of antibiotics contribute to resistance. High levels kill the bugs. They can't get resistant. Low levels do. So it's very important that we get this right. But what happens is we don't break down in our bodies antibiotics, we pee them out, and they go into the environment. They go through our sewage systems and out into the sea. Some of you may, a couple of weeks ago, have read the article from Exeter University. Ten years ago, E. coli, a particular bug, no resistance found in the E. coli off surfing beaches of England. Now, more than one in a thousand bugs have resistance genes to antibiotics in the surfing water. It's out there. It's very worrying. We then respray it into our agriculture, and antibiotics are also sprayed onto vegetables and crops and things. So antibiotics are everywhere, and they're picked up by wildlife. What about, as I've been told to call pets, companion animals? The cats, the dogs at home. Many of you may know that when you go to uh, what I used to call Manchester Royal Infirmary, the main hospital, you'll be, if you're coming in for an operation, screened for MRSA. I could show you the evidence of how many people transmit their MRSA to their cat that they kissed and snuggled up to on the sofa or in bed, who then passes it to someone else, or when they've cleared it themselves, passes it back to them. A real issue in companion animals. But the food animals are the bit that worry me particularly. They'll notice that drinking water can take it into them. It is now, in the developed world, quite common, if you're doing industrial meat production, to use antibiotics mixed with feed in order to get growth promotion. Cheap meat. It's cheaper than hygiene, after all. In Europe, we have strict regulations. I'll come back to that. But in the States, 
The, they don't, and the industry lobby is very strong. So we get food animals fattened up by giving them antibiotics. If only it stopped there. But then you get bugs passed around by handling in, in the whole of the food chain and preparation. And um, you get more and more bits of our life systems involved. I'm even told that quite a lot of warships have a, an antibiotic called tetracycline in their paint in order to stop barnacles sticking to them, because that's much cheaper than cleaning the barnacles off. Yeah, great. But actually, tetracycline is quite a useful antibiotic. So we have to rethink it. And you know, this has an extraordinary cost for us. We've been doing some modeling. Um, and if you look over the next five years, without any new antibiotics, we'll have about 20,000 cases of multi-resistant, nasty, that's the gram-negative blood infections, which will amount to probably about 5,500 excess deaths. Most will be older people. Particular problem in care homes or in hospitals. But there will be children too. And this is very worrying. We're starting to see some of this in our hospitals, in our care homes. And that original report I showed you had modeling that showed we probably have about 5,000 deaths every year in England of E. coli, of which half are resistant to antibiotics. And if they're resistant, it doubles the cost and it doubles the length of time in hospital. Over a 20-year horizon, our model shows, for the UK only, remember, masses of bugs that you can't treat in bloodstreams, leading to vast numbers of excess deaths and morbidity. And that's just the simple modeling. What about what it'll do to our favorite hospitals? They're all our favorite hospitals if you live next to them, but we need them. Well, we've got to consider the length, increased length of spare uh, care, the impact on intensive care units. We're going to have to up our hospital cleaning, our hygiene and dialysis units will have to be closed for deep cleaning on a regular basis. And the costs for all of this are going to be massive. We reckon it's about 300 million pounds a year to an upper limit of 2.4 billion, the NHS costs. So clearly, we need to look after our antibiotics. And we aren't doing. So what you see here is a map from 2012 of antibiotic prescriptions by um, area. They're called CCGs, it doesn't matter. Why is it that in one part of the country, Newcastle West, they give double the number of prescriptions that they do in Camden in London. Well, maybe case mix, maybe there's a bit more illness, but that doesn't explain it all. So, should we all be at the 4% or is that even higher than it should be? I bet it is. But how can we change that? Because that's not only about education of doctors, it's also about the public. I won't leave here until you give me an antibiotic for my sore throat. I've had patients say that to me. Little Johnny might die overnight if you don't give me the antibiotic, and I'll have you if you don't give me the antibiotic. It's a very difficult environment. We all have to educate everyone. We all have to take just a little bit of risk. Because if we don't take that little bit of risk, the grandchildren of all of you will have a much bigger risk of death because there won't be any treatment. I think it's important to say we're not the worst, we're not the only ones with variation. We are actually quite good, but we're still not good enough. This is a global problem and we can't do it alone. 
we have to strengthen international collaboration and we have to work both at the local level, GPs, hospitals and everything, and at the global level, trying to strengthen it. And we want to work together. And I mentioned to you earlier about how global things work. So here, what you can see in orange is an important bug um, and carbapenems are our most imp about our most important antibiotics. And resistance was first found in 2000 in North Carolina. And uh, within five years, it was widespread in Israel, Italy, Colombia, and Sweden. The other Klebsiella pneumonia resistant to carbapenem that I've shown here started in New Delhi and within two years had spread to Sweden, the UK and Canada. One study I like to talk about is a recent study from Sweden where they checked the bugs in the guts of young men going travelling. Did you know that of our bodies, one and a half kilos is bugs? in us and on us. We have more bug cells as part of our bodies than we have human cells. They're called the microbiome. And of these young men who went traveling, when they came back, 25% had in their microbiome, in their gut bugs, antibiotic resistance that they hadn't had before they went traveling. Well, most of the time that doesn't matter, but what happens if they pass that to someone who's ill or they get ill themselves? If you look at the impact and what it means, I've just picked up here something from um, the World Economic Forum in Davos, which has been quite influential. You can see dramatic costs to society. Um, I've talked a bit about our costs and our modeling, but they have costed it much higher. Um, and in the States, they cost it at costing 30 billion pounds a year to the healthcare system alone already. We have a problem around the world that most more places, countries than not, allow antibiotics off prescription, so they're totally on control. And there's quite a lot of what are called falsified and counterfeit medicines that are bought over the counter. So imagine yourself in a poor village, and you don't feel well, so you think antibiotics, so you go along and you buy some. Well, you might just buy enough for that day, but then not be able to afford more. It's not good to kill the bugs off. If you buy a good number, you might then share them out around the family, because they do do that, or you might even do what you should do and break your bank, impoverish your family, but actually, the level of antibiotics is so low in that counterfeit and falsified medicine that it promotes resistance and doesn't work. So it is a real problem. And um, we've got uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, not only off Japan, but even and our surfing beaches, as I told you, but even in the Antarctica. Isn't that tragic? It's very worrying. So we've got to do something about this. So after I published my report, there was an in-government discussion. Hmm, what do we do about that? And they really beefed up the cross-government antibiotic um, AMR strategy and set up a very senior group to debate what are we going to do and how are we going to do it. And they set up the objectives, which I think are a great start. I want to go further, but you have to start somewhere. Returning antibiotic prescribing to 2010 levels in primary care, 2012 levels in secondary care, measured by total um, consumption. It's going to be difficult because people are used to prescribing a lot. Patients are used to getting a lot. But we can only really manage this if we move forward the science because... We actually need to prevent more infections, hygiene, sanitation, hand washing in hospitals at home, in the food chain, very important. But we don't have enough basic research and understanding. We don't have rapid diagnostics, and I'll come back to that. 
you know, if the GP could say, swab, swab your throat, actually, that's a virus, it's not a bug, your little Johnny can't have an antibiotic, it would be much easier for that discussion, wouldn't it? We don't have those, we're working at it. And we really need to understand much better all these antibiotics going into animals and what that means. So all of that needs doing, and we need to know what's going on, much better surveillance. That's quite hard. I've already, I think, labored the issue quite heavily that we need to conserve what we've got. But actually, when I went into it and said to the experts, so is this guideline right? They'd say, well, yes, by what we understand, but we don't know this, this, and this. There's a terrific amount of work that needs doing. We do need, know that we need to wash our hands. And there is a quite nice study in motorway service stations showing that about 30% of men wash their hands properly. Rather more women do, but not as many as I would like, just over half. There's a lot that all of us can do. We need to do more with animal health, um, both in the veterinary facilities, but also about how they're prescribed. But I do want to show you a couple of successful stories. So I am told, I can't find verification, but I'm told when you eat farm salmon in America, it has eaten its weight in antibiotics by the time it hits your plate because they tip antibiotics into the feed. It is cheaper than hygiene. So what do they do in Scandinavia and Scotland? They individually vaccinate them. Look at that. And it's not difficult. Three vaccines mixed together, shoot them in. Um, I've actually got a picture of uh, the uh, uh, Norwegian royal family doing it, but I couldn't find it today. And look at the impact on antibiotic use coming down in orange and fish yield in tons going up. It works. So why can't we do more hygiene and everything in the rest of the animal rearing population? After all, in 2002, the National Pork Producers Council of the US reckoned it would only increase the cost of rearing a pig by £2.80 for the whole pig if they took antibiotics out. Some people are starting. Here's an example of a major US chicken producer who's announced they're going to get rid of the human medically important antibiotics. They've begun to realise that this is really important. The McDonald's announcement wasn't quite as strong as this. They were coming much in line, but not as strong as this. So people are beginning to recognize, like saying it's organic or whatever, saying the antibiotics have not been given routinely is an advantage. But we mustn't forget, and I'm not going to spend time on it, what I said that when we take these antibiotics, we pee them into the system, they go into the see they come back through, and this is all driving the system. In the UK, in animals, look at the amount of tonnage going into animals, and we're 14th out of the EU states. So let me show you there our use compared with other EU states. Interestingly, the Netherlands is one of the highest, yet in humans, because they have a search and destroy program for MRSA, they have less of a problem than we do. So it's a very interesting balance where you put your effort. Now, what is particularly interesting is where does America come out? Does this work? Yes. So the American bit would be up there, 300, whatever the units are, milligrams per kilo of meat produced um, is used. It is really dreadful. So what are we trying to do in the UK? We're trying to reduce use in livestock. We're measuring the changes in total prescribing, and we're looking at vaccines. But because we're short of time, let me move on and talk a bit about why we haven't got new antibiotics. I've shown you the gap in production, and it's quite a simple market issue. 
if someone makes a drug that's very expensive, like a cancer one, they'll get a profit. If they make something that's cheap, but they make a little bit of money, and we take them every day, statins, blood pressure drugs, diabetes drugs, whatever, they make a big profit. Do you make an antibiotic? We expect them to be cheap. As a society, they are very cheap, far too cheap. And we only take them on average, not even once a year, do we? So there's not much profit to be made. There are no end of global challenges, and this is what the Prime Minister asked Jim O'Neill to look at. And he's producing a series of discussion papers that all of us are discussing, and he's leading those discussions around the world with senior government people, our president, I'm sorry, not our president, our prime minister was, that was a slip, our prime minister was discussing MR with Angela Merkel, the chancellor, at the G7. He wanted to and knew it was important. She put it on the agenda. She is very committed to this. But Jim, without any prompting from me, came up with Gosh, we need to do things to make what we've got to go further. We need new diagnostics, rapid diagnostics. We've got to get the next generation of people in. We've got to modernise surveillance. He came up with all of these things. In fact, he's proposed a two billion innovation fund over five years, and he says that pharma should pay for it because there are things that need to be done now while we work through the... PPPs and the big expenditures we're going to need. Because if you look at that right-hand side, which I've uh, highlighted here, you can see in blue the number of high-priority, important antibiotics in the pipeline that may but probably won't come through. And here is some really interesting research done by the Pew Foundation, the, their charitable Trust, they looked in December 2014 with, across pharma and biotech and found 41 antibiotics currently in development. Five have received, um, right, only half active against urgent threats, 16 against the really important ones. It's much better on the screen, isn't it? Three active against the majority of most resistant bacteria, and we know from experience only one in five of them will work in humans and reach the market. So think of all of that, and then remember, it takes on average 23 years for a drug to get through the development pipeline and onto the market to treat all of us, treat our grandchildren. I pray we have them for that. So his little innovation fund, which is that little blue dot, 0.4% of the profit of pharmaceuticals and the money they have to spend, would be peanuts, wouldn't it? But uh, he's discussing. We've got other challenges that we need to work through, as well as new antimicrobials and how we incentivize everyone to do that. Are the novel therapies, that, that picture on the right is a phage, the Russians... And I think the Turks used to use lots of phages. There are difficulties, but maybe we're going to have to go that way. New antiseptics, monoclonal antibodies, vaccines. We have to look at this in different ways. We have launched a competition for um, a rapid diagnostic, the Longitude Prize, which the Prime Minister launched last year, being the 300th year of the Longitude um, um, prize being won originally, a gimbal for sailing, so you hold, held your um, compass stable. Beautiful. And many of you may have voted for one of the six technologies that were suggested for this prize. Uh, low carbon economy, uh, flying without petrol and stuff, um, all sorts of well, half a dozen interesting ideas. But over 100,000 people voted that the prize should be given for a rapid diagnostic for antimicrobial resistance. And entries opened last week, and we're watching this with fascination. There's a £10 million prize. It's being run by Nesta. 
there is research going on. There's actually some, her hair's standing on end because she's at the space station because um, apparently antibiotics are less effective in microgravity. Meanwhile, in this country, we've funded with many people, other funders, um, a number of research units and centres that get onto that. And I won't go into the detail. We work with the um, MRC, the Medical Research Council, and others with the US through, um, through the EU, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, and a number of other ways. So there is research funding coming into this area. Indeed, there will be a lot more. And occasionally, we get uplifted. We all were in uh, January when they announced a new antibiotic. It hasn't gone into humans yet. It's just beginning to trouble, which was found by looking in soil using new culture techniques. Very exciting. But it is for the MRSAs, which good old antiseptics can manage, rather than these nasty Klebsiella, E. coli, gram-negatives, the ones we really need. But I wouldn't want you to think that hygiene and standard medical practice really made to work can't do something. So here, the top line is Clostridium difficile that was happening in hospitals. The lower line, the blue one, is MRSA. And look how they came down dramatically over those few years from 2010 to 2014 by hand washing, by careful antibiotic use, by protection. We can make a difference. Indeed, I think that our government five-year strategy will make a difference and make this work. We're looking at how we can improve infection control. And each and every one of us in this room has a role in that, not just in the home, not just if you're a clinical professional or a manager in a hospital, but when you or your loved ones are in hospitals and GPs by saying, hey, you didn't wash your hands. Hey, you forgot to use the alcohol rub. And actually highlighting it. We all have to do that to protect our families, protect our environment, and make it work. There's a lot going on. Let me just show you some of our achievements. In that original report, I said I wanted this to go on the government risk register. This created a lot of entertainment for people, they said. New CMO doesn't know what she's doing. But actually, of course, if something's on a government risk register, you have to take notice. And we'd done the modelling, and it went first on the Department of Health's risk register, then on the Department for Environment and Agriculture's risk register, and it's now on our government risk register, it took two years, next to terrorism, pandemic flu, and climate change. Because this is an equivalent threat, and something needs to be done about it. We've got, as I've shown you, a UK strategy, and we're making good progress on that, and it's cross-party. This isn't party politics at all. I've shown you the work of Jim O'Neill, which is the Prime Minister's personal commission. I've talked about the, the Longitude Prize. I haven't yet mentioned the Fleming Prize. So hidden in the small print and one sentence was the Chancellor, George Osborne's, um, offer in the last budget before the election of £195 million of overseas development aid, the Fleming Fund, so that we can help um, poor countries develop their laboratories and their surveillance so they can bear down on the problem in their countries. Because we can't do this again alone, and we need to transfer technology and help these people, because otherwise it won't work. We've had a lot of success internationally, too. So um, we went immediately after that was published to the WHO and said, you know, we've got to do something about this. So last year, we took a resolution through uh, saying there should be a global action plan. In May, 196 countries signed up to the global action plan for antimicrobial resistance. The Director General said to me afterwards, she said, well, Sally, 
I thought because of your energy and commitment, backed up by the government right at the highest level, you would make this happen. I thought it might take five years or longer. Two years, this is impressive. And the why is because our foreign office did the diplomacy all around the world. They went to visit finance ministries, health ministries, everyone arguing that they had to support it. And now um, a similar uh, resolution has been through the UN Organization uh, for Food and Agriculture on Saturday and should be voted through this coming Saturday. This is impressive. And both those resolutions say, we will take AMR to the UN, probably the General Assembly, next year to try and get real connected action across the world. It will be difficult because there are lots of people who worry about intellectual property or um, the drugs will be too expensive. We have to ensure not just that there isn't excess, but there is access. But if we don't go for this, it won't work. And there are ever-increasing national plans, and within two years, as a result of that global action plan, every country has to have a plan, and they will be monitored and helped and supported to do this. President Obama has mentioned it in, in his State of the Union address. I've told you about Chancellor Merkel. Um, indeed, President Obama, I'm told, had a very good meeting on it at the White House only last week, my American colleagues tell me. So it really is beginning to move. Indeed, his Council of Advisors on Science and Technology released a national action plan, which is actually not that different from our plan anyway, um, in March of this year. Just to show you what's in our WHO um, Global Action Plan, it's all about improving awareness and understanding, strengthening the knowledge and evidence base, effective sanitation, hygiene, infectious prevention, optimizing use, and then the R&D, and needing an economic case. It's motherhood and apple pie. No one can argue with this, though some did. We have to do it to protect our futures and our children. We've got some real effectiveness measures built into this global action plan about reducing consumption in different ways, measuring it different ways, including in animals. And that's very, very important. I've actually already mentioned the Fleming Fund, so uh, I don't need to do um, and take that further. But let me just, as I finish, say, you know, how many people can put their hands on their hearts and say their infection prevention, their hygiene, wherever they are, whether it's at home or work or in a healthcare setting, is perfect, is good. How many doctors and nurses can say they stopped an antibiotic when there was no bug on the cultures or they changed it at the moment it was done? Not many of us. How many people looking after animals, whether as pets or in agriculture, fully understand the damage that overuse can do? And how many people out there don't understand that there are no more antibiotics at the moment coming through? What we've got is what we've got. A few in the pipeline will be a drop in the ocean and resistance will develop to them. It's only a question of how long. Some of them, it develops quite quickly. We are trying hard to change this. We've um, been having a campaign from Public Health England um, aiming at the GP practices that are in the top fifth, top 20% of prescribing, giving them things, posters, as you can see, leaflets, having a discussion with the GPs through the Royal College of General Practice guidelines and everything. And there's a lag in the data, so I can't tell you the exact results, but it is looking as if there may be about a 4% reduction in use, which 
is significant if that holds true as we go through. But you know, we're all in this together and we've all got to change. And I think that is the sadness. Many people think, well, um, it's a NIMBY issue, not in my backyard, not me. I'll have my antibiotic, they can sort it out. And actually, that's not going to work. So what can you do? Well, you could go onto the Public Health England website and watch the short video about it and sign up to be an antibiotic guardian. You can read about it, you can hear about it. I've, I've written the book and I don't take the, um, the money for it, the co-authors do. So I can recommend it to you if you want to read more. But please, just be aware and think about our future generations. Because if we don't get this right, and I believe we have a duty to, they may not live at the 20 years extra we have thanks to antibiotics. Thank you very much. So thank you, Sally. You can tell she's a Manchester graduate, obviously. Um, that was a brilliant talk about a very important subject, but what I do want to stress is just how much Sally has led on this purposely, on the, something that is a global issue. We're going to take a f just a, a few questions, because there are people, actually, who couldn't get into the theatre, such was the popularity, that are in the overflow, and they haven't had the pleasure of seeing Sally in person. So I will take a, f a small number of questions, then we'll pop up and say hello to them. So who wants to, if you want to... Put up your hand on the front <laughs> row down here. Yes. Uh, if off, the oh. Can you just wait for the microphone, I think? Sorry. We need a microphone. <laughs> okay, go on, shout. <laughs> Good health, there you are. Thank you. As the world's population is going to increase with, as the years go by, you're going to get greater poverty, and therefore people, uh, these people are not going to be in a position, for one reason or another, to uh, keep down the amount of uh, microbial disease. You've also got the case of animals, from nine feet from every person, there's a rat, which was the uh, statistic given a bit ago. What's being done about the rats? And of course, you've got all the stray dogs and cats around the place. This is a problem. What Thank you. do you propose to do? Well, I don't think luckily, Sally can solve the world rat problem. But well, on the other hand, rats and dogs, if they're stray, are not being fed antibiotics. So that's a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> it is a good thing. Yeah. No. But you're quite right, yes. Major issues. We seem to have questions all in one cluster. Is there anybody in another part? And then I'll go back over there. Have we got there? Yes. And then I'll come back to one over here. I'd like to congratulate you on a wonderful lecture. Um, I just have a little dilemma in my mind. When I was growing up, I was encouraged to play in soil, eat the occasional worm, but wash my hands before I had my tea, the idea being I would build up a certain amount of natural immunity. So how do you strike a balance between very serious personal hygiene and building up natural immunity? Well, it's interesting that I was famous in North London for when my kids started eating soil, and they were all getting, you know, these mothers twitched. I'd say, oh, let them. It's very good for their immune system. But I did insist on them washing their hands before they sat down to tea. So the answer is, you know, it's hygiene about fecal matter. It's hygiene in healthcare settings. But it, it is a normal, healthy life and meeting the bugs that are out there that are healthy bugs. We'll take one over there. You Can I echo the sentiment of how good you've presented your statements? I was at the first European Asbestos Forum in Amsterdam two weeks ago, 
and we agreed that the situation for the future, um, whilst it's going to be worse because of AMR, we have air pollution and nanotoxicology totally unregulated, and this will be an additional problem to AMR. Um, can I repeat the gentleman's question? What are you going to do? <laughs> I think this is a little unfair. Sally is the chief medical officer, not the chief environmental officer, but do comment if you would like to. Well, um, I can only pick up a number of things to really advocate for, as well as, you know, advising on Ebola, MERS, COVID and everything. And I've chosen this. Others would wish I'd chosen some other things. I do other things, but... Um, I will worry beside you, but I'm afraid I won't be going out on the wall path. Okay. Uh, one at the front, then one here, and then we'll probably have to go upstairs in a moment. Uh, is that, have we got a microphone you have? Yeah. There's one right at the front. You've had your hand up for a while. Down here. Thank you. Is it me? Yes. Um, Jeremy Phillips, I'm Secretary of Manchester Council for Community Relations and Chairman of Equity, the Writing Membership of Equity Actors Union. Um, I was born in 1938, right? Um, I'd like to say thank you, Dame Sally, for finishing up optimistic note there because I was getting very much like Howard Hughes there. I was worrying about every germ that's around me and near me and, and anywhere else. And I already washed my hands before I go to the lavatory because I think I know where that's been, but I don't know where that's always been. So. <laughs> Which is true, I wash my hands before I go, why not? Yeah. God knows what you've been doing. I mean, seriously. I'm, anyway, the point, my point is that um, I have got degrees. I've got them in the 50s from St. Martin's in London, um, in fashion, art, theatre, design, only for Leipzig, Cambridge. The thing, I'm, I'm roughly, I'm going quickly. The thing is that, um, that I'm not as silly as I look, right? Um, that thing about giving antibiotics to animals, I always thought antibiotics was to prevent or to cure disease. Now, if it, as a side, Effect it fattens up animals. Surely they can find something else to fatten up animals with. I mean, what's, what a waste! Thank you. It just happens that it fattens up animals and probably humans very cheaply. So I think it's an abuse of antibiotics, and we're in full agreement. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. One question I wanted to ask you is. Have we considered actually removing antibiotics that are in the environment? Has there been some assessment of options to do that? Um, not a serious uh, look at it that I know of. I mean, they are everywhere. Because if you think about it, bacteria produce their own antibiotics against other things. Insects do. I mean, all these things are producing products to fight each other. I think it might be rather difficult, but it's a, a real left field thing. I'll ask some of the experts. Thank, Thank you. you. So we're going to take the last question right at the back. Sorry, we could have go on for ages. Yes? Is that me? Yes, that's you. Is that me? If you've got Should we be taking you? vegetarianism more seriously? Uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> 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 I did warn you, Sally. <laughs> um, I think it is about abuse of antibiotics. Uh, you can bring up fish without any antibiotics. We can do a lot more in the meat production to reduce antibiotics to treating sick animals. Thank you. So, on that, thank you again, Sally, for a fantastic lecture. It was, uh, as it should be, entertaining, educational, and informative. And can I just finish by saying thank you all for coming. Thank you to all of our alumni for how much you do for the university. And a reminder, we have just over a week until the closing of the vote for our next chancellor. And if you are a registered member of the alumni, you have a vote, so please use it. So thank you again, Sally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.